Hello there. Welcome to part two of this week's Talking Europe on France 24. My guest today is a former finance minister of France and now the man in charge of economic and financial affairs, taxation and customs at the European Commission. Pierre Moscovici, thanks very much for being with us. Hello. Well, I'd like to start off with uh, something that's very much in the news all across Europe, uh, and we've been talking about it in part one of our show. This ongoing diplomatic row sparked uh, by the chemical attack on a former Russian spy in the UK. Now, our guests in the debate were somewhat divided over whether European solidarity over this is going to hold as the case goes on, time passes, Russia, of course, pushing for more proof, and the UK getting closer to Brexit. No, I'm, I'm quite sure there will be a, a total and long-lasting European uh, solidarity on that. Uh, the decision that was taken by uh, all European countries, uh, the, the withdrawal of diplomats, uh, the uh, also exit of uh, Russian diplomats, this shows that we are united. Uh, there is obviously a, a motive, there is also a modus operandi, uh, there is a kind of signature uh, for the time being, well, of course, proofs will need to be showed. Uh, and if they are confirmed, uh, then there will be a total solidarity. If they are not confirmed, I don't take that as serious, then there will also be solidarity. Uh, so facts uh, will be uh, the uh, very important point, but solidarity is there totally. And uh, the decisions taken was not taken like that or for political matters they were taken because everybody thought uh, that uh, it was a Russian problem. And I'm quite sure that uh, our British friends uh, will uh, see that we are totally uh, behind them, with them, mm -hmm. at their side. N there is n not a single relation between that and the Brexit. It's another point. All right, well, uh, looking... uh, and, and the Brexit is not for tomorrow. The UK is a member of the European Union. For another year. Uh, for a year. And so, well... And after the Brexit, the UK won't be probably a member of the European Union. It will still be a, a U European country with which we will have the, the, the strongest uh, and the closest uh, relation possible. That's what we want. That's what I want. Well, before I come to my next question on the Russia issue, you said that the UK will probably not be a member of the EU. Do you still see a potential for the UK to change its mind and stop Brexit? There is a possibility, and certainly the door is not closed uh, from our side, but it's up to the British people to decide. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, there has been a decision taken by referendum. Uh, we m can regret it, and I regret it. We, we can think that it is a lose-lose situation, and I truly believe that. Uh, there is still a possibility that the British people themselves decide to have another referendum. Mm -hmm. It's not that likely, but why should I exclude that? Uh, and why should I discourage those who believe that the UK must belong to the EU? Uh, since my strong belief and personal belief and political belief is that it's better to be together. But again, well, uh, there is a matter of sovereignty and very likely, more than likely, on the 29th of March 2019, the UK won't be any more uh, a member of the EU. We will regret that. All right, well, uh, let's come back to the Russia affair. Um, in terms of how to deal with uh, this situation, obviously diplomats have been expelled, but some voices, for example, Transparency International, are saying the UK should be sort of hitting uh, wealthy Russians that are based in the UK. There are many of them. They have a lot of assets there, property, that kind of thing. Uh, Transparency International claiming that the UK sort of rolls out the red carpet to people who have money that was illicitly acquired in Russia. I know that you deal a lot with uh, tax havens, that kind of thing, in your work at the Commission. Should the UK be doing more about this issue? Well, this is also a different point. You could advocate for that. It's certainly not illegitimate. But if you want to deal with the Scripple case, uh, you need to uh, have a, a response which is political. And so uh, there are diplomatic answers. And uh, it's uh, between states. Uh, it's not uh, something which has a relationship with private people. But is it perhaps the moment to uh, sort of lift the lid 
perhaps on uh, practices. Again, again, that's another point. My, 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 my action as tax commissioner for uh, more than three years now is dedicated to that uh, fight tax fraud and tax avoidance, uh, fight for transparency, fight for fairness and justice. And uh, this uh, is also something that needs to be applied to everybody. Uh, the point is that since the competencies of uh, the EU are what they are, uh, I can act on corporate tax, I cannot act on individuals. Mm. This is something which has to do with uh, then states, member states. And uh, again, the UK is a member state of the EU, for the time being at least. OK, well, closer to home uh, and direct work of the European Commission. A big topic at the moment is fair taxes on these digital giants, talking about Amazon, Apple, these companies that almost everybody uses or knows at least. Uh, a proposal for a 3% tax on turnover uh, hasn't gone down very well uh, with the European leaders. Uh, several European countries do have digital giants based on their territory. They provide thousands of jobs. Can they really be convinced? Uh, I'm talking about the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Ireland, for example. First, why this proposal? This proposal has been made, and I made it, uh, in the name of the Commission, because those uh, internet giants, not only the so-called GAFAs, but something like uh, over 150 companies, 50% mm -hmm. uh, of them being American, uh, one-third between European and the rest, Mm -hmm. the rest of the world, uh, they don't pay their fair share of tax where they create profits uh, and value. Uh, to give you two figures, uh, the average uh, corporate tax paid by uh, these uh, companies is 9%, whilst for the rest of the economy it's 23%. We have an obvious problem of equity or, or level playing field, and uh, if you add to that that those companies are the ones who uh, have the highest growth of all then you see that it's totally unfair. But and the likes of the Netherlands, Luxembourg, etc., say it's fine by no, us, no. that it works for so, us. So I think that what we propose is really as well substantial, proportionate, 3% is not that much, um, that it's not damaging for the economy because it's about user value, mm -hmm. it's not about the, the place where this is uh, producted, produced. And so uh, I think that there, we need to look at that carefully. Uh, I know that some countries are reluctant, mm -hmm. well, we need to convince them, but I also uh, observe that there are quite a lot of countries, around 20, which are favourable to the proposal I made, and among them, uh, France, Germany, Italy, Spain and the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, the five biggest member states of mm. the Union are for that, mm. uh, and why? Because they are conscious of their global responsibility, we need to have this new uh, taxation system. It's a question of fairness and, uh, and our citizens wouldn't understand those who tend to block that. Let's talk about some news from right here in France then. A strike at the national railway company SNCF has made headlines all around the world with pictures of people sort of clambering onto trains through windows, that kind of thing. Now this is set to continue as a three month rolling strike. It is going to cause trouble for many travellers. Uh, it's all about the French government trying to privatise parts of the SNCF. Uh, our reporters have been over to the UK, where the railways were privatised in the 1990s. See how it works there. This is from Jonathan Walsh and Haxi Mize belkin When the state privatised UK railways in the 1990s, it said free market competition would mean better service and lower prices. But today, British trains are the second most expensive in Europe after Switzerland and 60% of voters want the railways to return to state control. Before privatisation, back in the 1970s and 80s, growing up in Manchester, we had um, National Rail, and I do remember that it was very punctual, and I just remember it being very cheap. These trains are making so much money, and part of the money could be ploughed back into improving the services. Another contentious issue, the fact that 25 years after state-owned British Rail ceased to exist, Many companies in charge of Britain's trains aren't even British. SNCF is involved, Deutsche Bahn is involved, so we have a very odd situation where uh, all these foreign state-owned companies are running our services, but a British government company would not be allowed to do so. Train operators turned down our requests for interviews, directing us instead to a group which defends the UK rail franchising system. It's a, a myth that these profits are all being rooted to shareholders and they are their enormous profits. Also, the franchisees take a lot of risk in taking the um, franchises on. They're not guaranteed a profit. 
One former transport minister isn't buying it. For him, the current system is chaotic and insufficiently competitive. My advice to President Macron over the management of the French railways would be bring in competition, but don't weaken SNCF as a company. What you want is strong private operators, strong public operators, good competition between the two. In compliance with EU directives, France is preparing to open up its railways to competition. The government insists the SNCF will remain a public company, but French rail unions look across the channel and worry that privatisation isn't so far off. There we go. Is that the future for France? Privatised railways, more expensive fares, all that kind of thing? I hope not, and I don't want that to happen. It's not because I'm a social democrat, but I feel very close to what Andrew Adonis uh, said uh, in that uh, uh, report, because uh, there is a need to open the railways to competition, but then each country can choose its own model. Mm -hmm. There is the British model. It's not my model, frankly speaking. I wouldn't favour the privatisation of uh, French SNCF, and I think that it would not be accepted by anybody, and it's not proposed by Mr Macron and his government. Uh, I think that if we need to look at another kind of model, you can look at Germany, where Deutsche Bahn is still a very strong public service. Mm -hmm. And uh, train railroads must be a public service. This public service can be competitive. It can be open to competition, but it must remain uh, a public service. It, you can modernize a company, and SNCF can be modernized, uh, but you must not destroy its identity, you must not destroy the uh, public service. And I would say that between the old-time monopoly and the savage uh, competition and privatization, there is, sorry to say it, a third way. That classic phrase. It must be the, the French third way. Well, let's talk about the European position on this. Um, there have been claims that Europe is imposing changes to the SNCF. Uh, this uh, comes from our Europe expert, Yves Bertoncini, who's been sorting through the facts from the fakes on this story. The European Commission forces France to tinker with state railway workers' employment rights. This is what controversial French writer Rick Zemmour stated on national radio RTL on February the 19th. But it's wrong. First, Eric Zemmour is mistaken on a political point. The Commission actually suggested France open up its freight railways to European competition and then, later on, the passenger sector. It was members of the European Parliament and national governments together who decided back in 2001 that competition should apply to Europe's railways. The Commission did not impose anything in this sector or anywhere else. Eric Zemmour's statement is also factually incorrect. European directives that address competition between national and European companies say nothing about the statuses of either companies or workers. These kinds of directives apply to public and private companies alike, whether employees are public sector workers or not. Only the companies involved and their national governments can rule on the status of employees. Take the example of Germany or the United Kingdom. The status of railway workers was changed as early as 1994, way before the directives on European competition came into existence. Today, reforming the status of French railway workers is solely France's responsibility. This choice is made in Paris, not by the European Union. There we go. So, uh, an example of how this story has gone into the kind of the realm of, fa of fake news a little bit. Um, but there is a good question, I think, uh, particularly as yourself, a long-standing member of France's Socialist Party. Uh, why should companies like the SNCF be opened up to competition? Just as a basic principle, why does that have to happen? The SNCF does work well. People who work for it have very good rights. Uh, SNCF has a, 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 a strong debt, a high debt. And I think that competition can lead to better service because uh, it's something which uh, is an incentive to transform the company and to offer uh, better uh, services. But uh, what Yves Bertolchini said is perfectly clear. Eric Zemmour is always making um, anti-European nationalist lie. 
uh, very often populist lies, sometimes extreme right lies, and this is not true. Uh, it's not because of Brussels that uh, the Macron uh, government is uh, deciding to reform SNCF, it's because it considers that there is a way uh, to uh, open the uh, sector uh, to competition. But again, uh, as we saw with the UK example, there are several ways. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a German way, there is the uh, French way, uh, there is the uh, UK way, and I think that we must find our way. All right, well, let's just finish on one quick last question. Uh, there's been some speculation, particularly in the UK, that English, the English language, is going to be pushed out of uh, Europe after Brexit and replaced by French. Uh, as a bilingual Frenchman in Europe, uh, do you see Brussels returning to the language of Molière, as it's known? Do we have to brush up on our subjonctif and passé simple and composé? I would like to tell you that um, after the 29th of March 2019, when I come to visit you, uh, you will have to speak in French and I will answer <laughs> in French too, because uh, French will be the leading language in Brussels. I would like to say that, but I'm afraid that we will still have uh, to uh, speak English uh, more than a bit. But I hope that will be a new balance and that uh, English won't be uh, the single or most important language in Brussels and in Europe because, well, since the UK has happened, uh, things must be uh, better balanced. But let's be also conscious that English is the international language and we will still have to use that, hélas. <laughs> Finishing on a French word. Well, thank you very much. Merci, I should say. Pierre Moscovici, a European Commissioner for, for Finance, Tax uh, and the Economy. Thanks so much. And thank you very much for watching the programme. We'll see you uh, next week for more European news.